Hello, my name is Senior Officer Sean France. I'm with the Norco College Police Department. I am one of many people here on the college to help keep you safe. As we wish we could be in all places at all times, unfortunately we can't. That is why we need your help. Maybe you or someone you know has been or is currently a victim of dating or domestic violence, stalking, sexual assault, or harassment. While this program is aimed at stopping future acts of violence, please know that what has happened to you or your loved one is horrible and we are truly sorry. We are here to help with many on and off campus resources. Norco College is committed to providing a safe learning and working environment for you, our students, our staff, and our faculty. Campus Sexual Violence Elimination, also known as the Campus Save Act, is a top priority at Norco College. But we do not tolerate sexual assault, harassment, dating, or domestic violence or stalking on or off campus. We hope you won't either. Take a stand with us and be part of a solution to making our lives and our campus safer. We now know that rapists are no longer just a scary man behind a mask. We now know that unwanted sexual advances cannot be prevented simply by changing the way we dress. We now know that the number one drug used in two-thirds of sexual assault is alcohol. We now know that one in three people face some type of relationship violence. We now know how dangerous this talking is and how quickly it can become violent. Did you know? The scenarios in this video are based upon real life events, although the people you see are reading someone else's story. The issues we will cover can affect you or a loved one. Maybe they already have. Today, we're gonna to focus on the importance and definition of consent, the realities of sexual assault, dating and domestic violence, stalking, and how to intervene as a bystander. If you experienced interpersonal violence in the past, parts of this video may disturb you, and we want to apologize in advance. We hope you understand the need to educate others in order to prevent future occurrences. Education is the key to being part of the solution rather than being part of the problem. Sexual assault refers to any sexual act directed against another person, forcibly or against a person's will. Or against a person's will, where the survivor is incapable of giving consent, as well as incest or statutory rape. Consent is the voluntary agreement to engage in a specific sexual activity during a sexual encounter. 90% of sexual assaults on college campuses are committed by someone they already know. Friends, classmates, co-workers, boyfriends, and girlfriends. It can be more psychologically scarring to be assaulted by an acquaintance than a stranger behind a mask. It can bring up issues of trust and self-awareness. I'd like to read you a story from a young lady. This is her story. She wrote, I'm not sure where to go, and I feel really bad about myself, and I know I need to tell someone what happened. It's easier for me to write it in this letter and I hope you can help me. Maybe I'm overreacting or, or what happened wasn't wrong. I think this is my entire fault. Last week I was in class and one of my classmates was staring at me. I felt a little uncomfortable about it but just tried to ignore him. After all, I didn't know him that well. I kept looking over at him anxiously but I returned his smile politely and looked down. After class, he approached me and asked me to have a drink with him. I don't usually go out with people I barely know, but I figured we had been in the same class for a while now, and he seemed nice enough, so I said, okay, and we could go have coffee. I was actually flattered he asked me out. He said, okay, and then said, maybe we could go to see a movie afterwards. I agreed, but was still a little hesitant. After the movie, he asked me if I wanted to go to his place and hang out for a while. I told him no, I couldn't because I had to go study for the test the next day. He walked me back to my apartment and when I tried to say goodbye, he pushed his way inside. By this time, I was really uncomfortable and shocked and didn't know what to do. I thought he might get mad if I tried to do anything. Then he started to kiss me and I wasn't sure what to do, so I froze. He continued to kiss me and take off my clothes. He told me everything would be good for me 
and I had sent him signals all night. He proceeded to have sex with me, and when he was done, he put his clothes back on, like what just happened was fine, and he left. I never said no, and I never fought back. I was just too shocked and scared to even move. Now, what can I do? I have this friend who just told me a story about her and her boyfriend that she had just been dating a couple months ago. Um, she said that one day she was at her house and she decided to call her boyfriend because her parents weren't there and they had gone out to dinner so she had a couple hours and um, after they got done watching a movie her boyfriend and her started making out and then he got on top of her and started trying to get um, really intimate and kind of like in, um, saying that he wanted to have sex with her without saying it, but just with the verbals of being on top of her. Um, so she got uncomfortable and she went outside because she told him, um, I forgot to call my friend because she, her friend had just gone through a breakup and she told her that she would call her and check up on her. So she left the room and went to another room and she immediately called her parents and asked, um, when they would be back because her boyfriend was there and she was feeling really uncomfortable. So her parents said not to worry that they would be back in a few minutes. So um, after she got off the phone, she went back to the other room where her boyfriend was at and she said, um, you're going to have to go because my parents are on their way home. So he, she was able to get out of that and he left. And when her parents got home, she was so relieved that they got there just in time because she didn't want to go through having to do that with her boyfriend. And if if she didn't come up with that scenario about her friend um, who just got broken up, she didn't know what she would have done if she would have been stuck with her boyfriend. My friend got this letter from her parents today and she wanted me to read it scared to think how this could have turned out if her parents didn't step in. This is what they wrote. We just wanted to tell you we got home from our cruise and had a great time. There was, however, one thing that happened that got me concerned. So I thought I would write to you and share our experience, the hopes you can share with others. When we were there in cause well we were in the stance club it was pretty hot and muggy outside so there were a lot of girls around 18 to 21 years old in their bathing suits dancing and drinking we noticed that there was one particular group of girls 19 years old who appeared really drunk and still drinking one of these girls was dancing with these two guys that were wearing jeans, no shirt, black tee or trench coats. One of these girls was dancing and her friends had gone to the back of the club and were laying on one of the seats, not paying attention to what happened to their friend on the dance floor. We were watching this girl and it seemed like the two guys were boxing her in dancing so close to her and putting her to the edge of the dance floor where the door was. At that point we knew. We knew we had to intervene or something bad would happen really fast. One of us stayed on the dance floor and we watched the girl and the other went to get her friends. We told her friends what was happening and then watched her friends come up and gone between their friend and the two guys and told her they had to go because they were supposed to meet up with other people. They got her out of the club and the two guys moved on. At the end of the letter, they said that they had hoped she, was, she would always be careful and look out for her friends. Others should learn from it. Whether you're in a relationship with someone or just met, the lines can become blurred very quickly. But remember, the absence of no does not mean yes, and it is not consent. 
If this ever happens to you, first, go wherever you feel safest. Home, police station, student health services office, a hospital, or the dean's office are just a few of your options. Second, get support. Talk to someone, a friend or family member, or come into the student health services and speak with a counselor. You don't have to do this alone. Third, preserve the evidence. Whether you want to press charges or not, do not wash or bathe in any way. While it is perfectly natural you want to do this, it'll destroy the evidence in the process. If you choose to change your clothes, place them in a brown paper bag in the event that you do decide to prosecute. Fourth, get medical attention. You may have internal injuries that you are unaware of and hospitals have highly trained staff to help you with this sensitive situation. A sexual assault response team exam is an option in courtesy of the Riverside County Regional Medical Center. They also can give you potentially necessary medication and help you preserve evidence. And fifth, seek counseling. People who have survived a sexual assault may also experience rape trauma syndrome, which has similar symptoms to PTSD, such as depression, social withdrawal, substance abuse, eating disorders, memory loss, and even thoughts of suicide. Student health services counselors are here to help. Remember, sexual assault is never your fault. There is a light at the end of every tunnel, even if it seems like there isn't. You are not alone. Here are some key things you can do to help prevent a sexual assault. First, be aware of your surroundings. Know who and what is around you. Know your limits and desires. Believe in your rights to set those limits. Communicate your limits as clearly as possible. If someone starts to offend you, tell him or her immediately and firmly. Dress comfortably. Dress however you like, but know that non-restricted clothing could be an advantage. Even if dressed provocatively, nobody has to be sexually assaulted. Avoid excessive use of alcohol and drugs, as this interferes with your reasoning and communication. Lastly, if you are walking alone, try and have a whistle with you and blow the whistle if you are in danger. This can help draw attention to you and scare the attacker away. Domestic violence includes felony misdemeanors, crimes of violence committed by a current or former spouse or intimate partner of the survivor, a person with whom the survivor shares a common child, a person who is residing in the same household as a survivor, or any person against someone who's protected from that person's act under the domestic or family violence law of the jurisdiction. Dating violence refers to violence committed by a person who is or has been in a social relationship of a romantic or intimate nature with a survivor. Women between the ages of 16 and 24 experience the highest rates of domestic and dating violence. Gay men experience rates of domestic violence similar to heterosexual women. One third of domestic and dating violence happens in the presence of a bystander, not counting the number of people who saw warning signs along the way. I found this letter the other day and I decided to read it. I don't think it was any uh, to anyone sp specific, but rather a letter someone had written just to get her feelings out. The letter talked about something that happened with her husband the other night at dinner. The woman said she and her husband had been together for three years now and for most of the time he was very verbally, financially, and physically abusive. The relationship had started out great. She just thought he was super attentive, but things changed drastically after the wedding. First, he would monitor her cell phone and text messages. Then he wouldn't let her go out with her friends. Then he made her stop seeing her family since he said they didn't like him. Finally, he started taking every cent of her paycheck, saying she wasn't responsible with money and couldn't be trusted to pay the bills. Then he started hitting her, saying she couldn't be trusted and she was going behind his back and seeing people. A few nights ago, they were at dinner and he started yelling at her and telling her she was acting like a baby and shut up. The woman said she could tell her husband was getting really worked up and she stiffened waiting for him to hit her when she heard a lady walked over to her table and tell him she had overheard the conversation and that he was getting out of hand. She told him she had notified the manager of the restaurant who in turn notified the police. She told him she was going to st say something to help me even when I couldn't help myself. My husband ended up leaving pretty quickly after that. The lady stayed with me until the police got there and I told them what happened. I knew then I was never going back. 
A group of friends were walking on campus and they saw a guy they knew from class. They said he had a bruise on his cheek and a bruise on his arm. When someone asked him what happened, this is what he told the group. He had been getting more serious with his partner and they were out at the movies last night. He said he saw some, some people from work that he knew and started talking to them for just a few minutes. When his coworkers left, his partner started accusing him of cheating on him and flaunting it in his face and saying that he was just too stupid to think anyone besides him would want to be with him. He said he just tried to calm him down and say that he was the only one he wanted and he wasn't doing anything. But his partner just stormed off angry and he followed him. When they got home, when they got home, his partner continued to yell at him and he threw a lamp and it struck him in his face, struck him in his face. He also said that his partner grabbed him, grabbed him by his arm and threw him against the wall and continued to yell some more. He said that everything was fine now and the bruises just looked worse than they actually were. He said his partner apologized and said that he just cared for him so much and he didn't want to lose him. He asked people, the, his friends that he met up with not to say anything and they just told him that he needed to get out of the relationship as soon as possible. But he just said that his partner assured him that it would never happen again. But people in the group are just afraid that things might just get worse. Today, a girl in class told us this story. A few months ago, she went to this party with a group of friends. She saw this guy she had been crushing on for a long time. He was cute, popular, and athletic. A lot of girls liked him, and she thought she would never have a chance with him. Believe it or not, he came up to her, to her and they started talking. They spent the entire night together just hanging out and talking and laughing. She thought he must really like her because he didn't want anyone else talking to her or spending time with her. When she got home 20 minutes later, he had already called her four times just to make sure she was safe. She thought, she thought it was really sweet. They started dating and she said he was constantly with her all the time. She said soon she couldn't even go out with her friends or family because he would get so angry and thought she was going to leave him. They would fight and then he would show up with flowers or candy and tell her how sorry, sorry he was and how much he loved her and how he just couldn't stand it when they weren't together and that he missed her so much. One night they went to a party and he went to get a drink. One of her male friends came over and gave her a hug and started talking to her. Her boyfriend came back and the guy left. Afterwards, he grabbed her arm and started pulling her and telling her she was his and no one else could touch her. Her friends saw what was happening and casually walked over and bumped into her boyfriend, causing him to spill his drink. Her friend was so um, embarrassed and he said it was fine and left to get another drink. Her friend was able to distract him just long enough that he forgot why he was so angry. After that, this girl made her mom aware of what was happening, and they called the police to report his behavior. It's a good thing because he knows what would have happened if he continued. He really needs help. There are warning signs you can look for in someone who may be prone to dating or domestic violence. Things such as extreme jealousy, like they don't want you talking to anyone else. Someone who is possessive, trying to control your life and tell you whom you can or cannot see. Or someone who has explosive anger and mood swings, blaming you for his or her own failures. Lastly, someone that puts you down or criticizes you frequently or touches you in a way that hurts or scares you. Extra warning for anyone intoxicated or high on drugs. 
While these signs do not guarantee the person is an abuser, they are worth taking note of and being cautious moving forward. Stalking occurs when an individual engages in a course of conduct at a specific person that would cause a reasonable person to fear his or her safety or the safety of others or suffer substantial emotional distress. These actions would include repeated behaviors that are unwanted, threatening, violent, or harassing in nature. One out of six women and one out of 19 men experienced stalking at one point in their lifetime. More than half of women and one third of men were stalked before the age of 25. This is a letter from a friend that she wanted me to read to, to create awareness about stalking. I'm gonna go ahead and read that for you today. May 13th, my day started like any other. I went to school, went to the library to study, and went to work. That was my norm. When I got to work that day, my coworker had a smirk on her face, and she said, you got something today, and pointed to some flowers. Flowers normally make a girl smile, right? Not me, not this time. The second I saw those flowers, I began to shake uncontrollably. I knew who they were from. I met Mike a year ago at a friend's party. He was nice enough that day. Not someone I was interested in dating, but nice enough to not give him the cold shoulder. One week after meeting Mike, it seemed as though he was everywhere. At first, I thought I was innocent enough. I thought maybe now that I've met him, I would notice him in places I never did before. It had to be a big coincidence, right? People go to the mall every day. People go to libraries every day. People go to the movies and out to eat every day, right? But then the phone call started. Then the text messages. He got my number from a friend and began asking me out for coffee and lunch. At first, I tried to be nice and say, no, I'm busy, or I can't, I'm going out with another friend until one day he asked me out to dinner. I told him I could and I had to work tonight. He responded, I know, I was talking about after your shift. You get off at nine, right? This made me a little uneasy, but I thought, well, everyone knows what time the mall closes, and said, no, I have stocking duties. I'll be getting out late tonight. When I left work that night, I could feel someone around me, but I didn't see anyone. I quickly jumped into my car and went straight home. When I got home, there was a box with a note on the door that said, those red heels are too sexy for work. So I bought you these, Mike. The next day, I texted Mike back and told him I, while I was flattered by his interest, I'm not interested in dating him or anyone right now. I couldn't accept his gift. He got very angry and asked why he wasn't good enough for me. At that point, I was a little freaked out and told Mike to please stop contacting me. For weeks, I would receive presents at my doorstep and degrading text messages to follow, calling me a slut, a whore, when I wouldn't accept them. It was like dealing with a real-life Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I wanted to change my phone number. Actually, I did change my phone number and email addresses to try and cut off all contact with him. But he was still there in the background, everywhere I went. Then, on May 13th, the day I received the flowers, I hesitantly read the card. The card said, go outside. Too afraid to move, my coworker called security and informed him of the situation. The security guard went outside and came back with a flyer. It had my picture on it with the word whore scribbled all over it. He said there were hundreds of them out there and that he would make sure to take all of them down. I quit my job that day. I lost my sense of self that day. I didn't feel safe anywhere. I felt helpless, like a prisoner. If I didn't go out for, if I did go out, it was for necessity and never alone. I didn't know what to do or who to go to. Luckily, the security guard at the mall got involved and reported the incident to the local police. I didn't know they could protect me. Mike had never touched or harmed me in any way physically. The police helped me get a restraining order and my life became my own again. I slowly but surely am getting back into the world of the living. I'd like to share with you a story. It's not mine, but it's a friend's. It's kind of personal, but I hope this would help someone. February 14th, the day I went offline. I'm a super social guy. I like to have friends and lots of them. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Foursquare, you name it, I had it. They were an easy way of staying in touch with everyone at a glance. The only problem was someone wasn't just glancing at mine. They used these sites to watch my every move. I got a friend request on Facebook one day from a girl I didn't know. She was pretty cute, so I accepted her. Mistake number one. Never accept a request from someone you don't know personally. Her profile said she went to a neighboring school and I had friends at so I figured that she had to be a friend of a friend. Mistake number two, never assume anything. You only see screen names and pictures, both of which can be faked. 
After accepting her request, really weird things started to happen. I started getting random phone calls where there would just be breathing on the other end. At first I thought it was just some of my friends trying to give me a hard time, but it went from one to two calls a week to three to four calls per day. Still not putting two and two together, after a few months of phone calls, I began feeling like I was being followed. Everywhere I went out, to eat, to the movies, to school, I just couldn't shake the feeling someone was watching me. No to anyone reading or listening. This something um, that if you feel something isn't right, it's probably not. Trust your gut. I wish I had, because it only got worse from there. One month later, there was finally a voice on the other end of the phone. They started asking me things like, how did you like your lunch at Red Robin the other day? Or, I liked your shirt you wore today. Where did you buy it? I couldn't figure out how they knew so much about me and my life, and it confirmed my gut instincts. Someone had been following me. Pretty freaked out at this point, I stopped answering private numbers on my phone. After a few weeks of not answering the calls, just stopped. Or so I thought. It was my sophomore year in college. I met an amazing girl and we started dating. The phone calls start again, only they were getting more out of hand. My stalker would leave me multiple messages saying, Who is that slut you had around your arm today? Or, How could you do this to me? I thought you loved me. You will both be sorry. It was Valentine's Day. I came out of my apartment to find my tires had been slashed and car windows had been smashed in. I couldn't take it anymore. I was in fear not only for my safety, but my girlfriend's. Obviously, this person n now knew where I lived. What if next time they broke into my apartment when I wasn't there? Or worse, when I actually was? I had no choice but to go to the police. I wish I would have gone earlier. I saved all the voicemails I had received in the most recent months and gave them to the officer taking my vandalism report. While investigating the vandalism to, the, to my car, the police found that my apartment had surveillance footage of the incident. I came into the station and saw a girl I recognized from my bio class breaking my car windows with a baseball bat. It turned out she was the mystery girl from Facebook, only the pictures didn't match. She picked a random picture from the internet and made a fake Facebook account. When I added her, she instantly knew everything about me. My favorite restaurants, stores, music books, everything. I posted pictures of myself at amusement parks. I checked in at movie theaters. I tweeted when I was hungry and where I was going. This is how she knew where I was and what I was doing all the time. I gave her all the information she needed to stalk me. February 14th, the day I went offline and never looked back. So this is a letter from a girl that I know and I want to tell you what happened. It all happened so quickly and I don't really know how it started or why. I was online one day and this guy from one of my classes started messaging me on Facebook. We talked online for about 30 minutes. I guess we both kind of flirted, but it was all innocent. Later that evening, I found out he had a girlfriend. She started sending me all kinds of messages telling me I better stay away from her boyfriend and that I must be one of those type of girls who steal other people's boyfriends. I was shocked. I told her I didn't know he had a girlfriend and apologized and thought that would be the end of it. I went to bed that night and I woke up. I had a ton of text messages and notifications from Facebook. Apparently this girl didn't believe me because she posted all kinds of horrible things to my Facebook and told me she was going to be waiting for me at school and I better watch my back. My so-called friend started believing the things she was saying about me and I had no one. I couldn't tell my mom, but I was starting to get scared and kind of depressed. I mean, all of this from an innocent conversation with her boyfriend. The postings didn't stop, and soon she took to Twitter and started telling people things that weren't true about me. And the other people I didn't even know, and people not even in our school started saying horrible things about me. My grades started dropping because I was so scared and depressed. Finally, one of my professors asked me to stay after class. She wanted to know what was going on and why my grades were starting to drop. I couldn't hold it in any longer. I broke down crying and told her everything that was happening. She told me it would be okay and that she was going go to go to the campus police and the dean. She told me we had rules against this type of thing. I didn't even know I could get help from my school. Once I told the police and the dean, the girl was disciplined and the postings died down. I will always be grateful I was able to help. I was able to get help that I needed. There are laws against stalking in California to protect you. Here are some things to ask yourself if you feel you're being stalked. Do you feel uncomfortable with the interaction? Does the person show up uninvited or hang around too much? Do they have a history of violence? Have they ever threatened you? 
With today's technology, stalking has moved from in-person to online. Have you received any threatening text messages or emails? Has anyone posted any unwanted or untrue things about you on social media? If you think you're being stalked, be aware of how quickly it can turn into a physical attack. It is not something to be taken lightly. Do not assume that the stalker is no big deal. Here are some things you can do if you are being stalked. Begin keeping record of every encounter and include details such as when and where and both of your locations. Inform the authorities. You can go to the campus police, the local police, or contact the college administration. Inform your stalker that you're not interested in further interactions and then cut off all the interactions. If necessary, change personal information such as phone numbers, email addresses, and all social media accounts. Be prepared in today's technological world. Learn to take screenshots and use your friend's phone to record and maintain evidence. You have the right to live a life free of fear and harassment. Remember, it's never your fault. You always have the right to protect yourself, physically and emotionally. When people intervene, they are likely to help the situation by preventing injury, helping the potential victim escape, or scaring off the potential offender. Not all acts of violence can be prevented. However, when we see a situation that just doesn't look or feel right, step up and step in. We know it's hard, but we have to ask ourselves, do we want to be part of the problem or part of the solution? Use the following three D's to help guide you. Delegate. Tell an authority figure, a friend, or a classmate what you see, and ask them to step in. Direct. Step up and confront the situation head on yourself and let all parties know you see what is going on and you will not stand for it. Distract. Use the tools you have on hand to defuse a situation, such as a spilled drink, an accidental bump, an invitation elsewhere, anything to change to the potentially dangerous situation. Help make our college safer for everyone. Immediately report any incident of sexual assault, domestic or dating violence, or stalking to the Norco College Safety and Police Department, or the Dean of Student Services, or the district's Title IX coordinator. Employees who have experienced a sexual assault, domestic violence, dating violence, or stalking may also report an incident to the offices of Diversity and Human Resources. In case of an emergency or ongoing threat, a survivor should get to a safe location and call 911. Stand up and be part of the solution to eliminate campus violence. For more information, please go to norcocollege.edu slash saveact.